like many of us, tonight's uh, two poets, their lives have been touched by loss and grief. Darius Jones and Kyle Harrigan are poets who have brought uh, a poetic study of grief and mourning, but also, very importantly, I should say that they're in the pursuit of solace as well. In an interview with the journalist Bill Moyers, uh, he asked Kyle Dargan, can poetry make a difference when kids are going hungry or their friends are being shot at? And Kyle Dargan replied, I think there's solace. Some people are moved to action, but I think there is an unfair pressure on poetry. But he also says that poetry operates at a motivational level. And there's, there's a huge truth to that. A review of Darius Jones' uh, collection, Burying the Rin, and an LA Review of Books article, <coughs> says that her work is a study of bereavement that offers solace. Because it, uh, because it will not be tidy or obey social mores. But so often we're encouraged to do the opposite of when we're not feeling well. It also mentions that her language is sought as shelter. We can understand how profoundly important this is when considering how few true sources of solace are. We have friends and loved ones that, that help us, but in the true moments of being alone and in trouble, what do you have at your book, at your, your fingertips? And often it's a book that provides comfort, companionship, and a deeper understanding of what pain is. Nothing, and it can be nothing short of life-saving, really. <clears throat> uh, first, we're going to hear from Kyle Dargan who is praised by Keith Leonard for marshalling the resources of sound and line and syntax into lucid and quietly insistent poems that soldier through loss and wonder to a kind of peace. Kyle Dargan is the author of four collections of poetry, Honest Engine, Logaria Dementia, Bouquet of Hungers, and The Listening, all published by the University of Georgia Press. He is currently Associate Professor of Literature and Director of Creative Writing at American University in Washington, D.C. Following him, Darren Rhys Jones will read um, her newest collection, <clears throat> Bearing the Wren. Uh, Lightman Smith said, is one of those collections of poetry that you want to press into the hands of strangers. <laughs> Darren Rhys Jones is a professor of poetry at University of Liverpool. Her most recent book, Burying the Wren, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. What It's Like to Be Alive, Selected Poems, will be published in 2016. She has edited the Blood X anthology, Modern Women <coughs> Poets, and is editor of Liverpool University Press's new contemporary poetry series, Pavilion Poetry. So first up, please welcome Kyle Darkin. Thank you. Um, as has been the case for all the readings I've attended uh, over the past few days, uh, Moya and Brown, that was a wonderful reading. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you to Pat and the organizers of the, the festival for inviting me. And I also, also have to thank um, Don Cher, who's the because I think that's the, the only reason that Pat ever heard about me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got lucky in uh, that way, too. Um, I have a, a friend in Limerick, uh, Pat O'Connor. Oh, I was hanging out with Pat in Limerick, and he uh, took me around the Shannon River. And as was the case, as was often the case when we were in China, talking about what's going on in the world, uh, him telling me about the pub closing uh, in uh, this Castle Comedy, and uh, guys jumping into Shannon, you know, after a recession, uh, trying to get insurance money, and me talking to him about. Uh, kids getting shot in my neighborhood and Donald Trump and all the other things that uh, <laughs> worry us in America. Then I realized that so much of my poetry just comes out of those kinds of exchanges. So if I were to sort of answer <coughs> the questions, uh, a lot of it would have to start with you know the conversation with the people that I know. Um, so with that in mind, I want to start with one of the poems from China. Um, when I'm pronouncing a Chinese word, I'm just going to put air quotes up somewhere. 
uh, what that is. And also Hanza, um, those are the Chinese characters, um, Hanza. So this poem is called Beautiful Country, China Cycle, number 11. The Hanza for Hai, I decipher from expressway signs above us as we depart the new port of Bin Hai. I ask Dongsha what Shanghai then means. No meaning. When it is named, it is just named. I struggle digesting her response. I know the phrasing of Mandarin's myriad characters harbors the figurative, the way holy as Hanza stacks the character for other atop the tree-like character for earth, re-sculpting the metaphor in calligraphy. I show Dongsha my strokes for a character that's caught my eye to ask again for translation. This means Beijing, one character. But Bei I've now memorized as North. I follow my finger through my book until it catches on Jing, capital. North, capital, Beijing, as much a name as a geographical distinction. Later, I glean Shang off street signs near my lodging. I open the dictionary, which confesses it means up, maybe upper, upper port, Shanghai, north of Hong Kong. I plan to tell Dongsha there was a duke of an old English York. The York that now cradles Manhattan is the new. I seek similar backstory when I ask what hides behind the Hanza's blades. Before I fancy myself a sleuth of language here in the middle nation, I must learn what I mean in Mandarin. After calling myself Meiguo for weeks, I realize that it can't be simply America. The book confides that May means beautiful, that I am a man from the beautiful country. I moan, heavy. The translation cannot be right. How do I explain to them all the beauty that is not found there? <coughs> So every year, the president gives a speech to the joint session of Congress called the State of the Union. Um, and it's practice that one member of the cabinet uh, stays away in an undisclosed location. They call the designated survivor. In the event that someone comes along and drops a bomb on everything, there'll be one person left with the authority to run the country. Um, the other aspect of the State of the Union is that pretty much security shuts down all of D.C. And I work on the west side and I live on the east side. So it pretty much means I can't get home um, on the night of State of the Union. Usually I just stay somewhere in a bar and watch it till it's over and all the <laughs> troops and helicopters go away. Um, so this poem is uh, State of the Union. I live in a land called East of the River five miles from the U.S. Capitol, where airspace must still be policed. No fly zones. Tonight, the <coughs> helicopter freezes into a shallow star blinking above my house, while the men and women of government herd themselves inside the Senate chambers. Our commander-in-chief and all his cabinet, save one, traditionally one, who is excluded and tasked with resurrecting our country should Russia, China, or what's left of Iraq try to bowl a ballistic 710 split toppling the monument and capital. Tonight, it's the agriculture secretary's duty to save us. It should always be our agriculture secretary. In times of crisis, a country needs before commerce or war or law to eat. And if Congress has allowed the appointment of an agriculture secretary who can't grow a pea, they might be not deserve oblivion. I prefer to imagine our Secretary of Agriculture hungered in its undisclosed location, listening to the speech on battery-powered radio, sifting seed 
through his dusty palms, deciding what must grow first in the aftermath of fire. <clears throat> Uh, it's another China poem, but not from this last trip. This was from 2010. Cormac McCarthy as translation. It's also a, a Midwest poem, too, thinking about the, the poem from Thursday. It's another Midwest poem. Cormac McCarthy as translation. We were in Iowa City reading The Road when Xiao Fan gently scolds us. You Americans always worried for, always in need of saving the world. Were it not for the fact that I know his sense of the American narrative is steeped in bootleg Michael Bay cinema from a Shanghai back alley contraband cave, he'll drag me inside months from now. I would consider his critique. Maybe some of wisdom's breath wafts within what he says. Maybe he can see us clearly, our bald-faced nationhood, here, against an unadorned middle America. Our God complex so obvious when wreathed with lush amber and green stalks. Another misconception that would be. For there is no such middle America. Everywhere, or the need to be everywhere, has no middle. And yes, planet America requires saving. Maybe that's why our stories all begin with the world almost ending here. That keeps us up at night, shatters our sleep, which Xiao Fan can't grasp because he's never been taught our pottery barn rule. Mm -hmm. That if you've saved it, then you've broken it. Then it's yours. I don't even, I'm not sure that that pottery barn was actually true. It's something that <laughs> <laughs> came up in the pres presidential election a couple years ago, um, talking about how we handled Iraq. Um, but then pottery bar kind of like, actually, that's not our policy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this next poem takes an epigraph. It's titled, rather, from a, a Lee and Lee poem. And I'm a, a big fan of the Young Lee's work, particularly his early work. Um, so I just lifted the title off of his poem. So what more could I, a young man, want? Arriving home, too tired to settle my house into proper repose. I stumble into slumber, leaving bulbs to emanate all night, a burning within the nest. Set then unattended, the senile dishwasher churns into the new day. At some odd hour I wake, maybe four, shallow sleep breached by phosphorescence. The air tinny with the rumpus of water's steady pelt against a mixing bowl. This house's restlessness is my own. The wood, the copper, the brick. All remember what they once were. Pine tree, palisade, shale. My God, how did I come to reside over this shrine to diminution? What life do I abandon? when I rise as a worker and toil for this privilege of living alone. Uh, my neighbor Skip is a carpenter and uh, he has this thing about um, migrant workers. He feels that uh, it's a big part of why he can't get work anymore. Um, not so much the fact that, you know, he's a 60-year-old carpenter, he can't carry 80, 90 pounds of sheet rock on his shoulder anymore, but he, he blames it on that. Um, so we have these conversations, and it's always a difficult place, so I want to be sympathetic, but I'm also like, Skip, that's racist. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, it comes out of one of those conversations. 
Two years from retirement, my neighbor contemplates Canada. <laughs> we meet at our leaning wall of cinder blocks that separates his yard from mine. We promise to write it plumb every year. Up till now, all talk, no rebar, no mortar. $50 an hour, good money, damn good money, he seconds. Arthritis now a hymn sung by the choir of his cartilage. I measure his gate's music as he climbs the four short notes back into his house to retrieve the papers. He brings back a ditto leaflet and a map of the Northern Territory speckled with throbbing circles, bullseyes. Those are the job sites. So many, one must wonder, what is Canada building? <laughs> or how is it that they lack enough carpenters of their own? My neighbor has faith that journey work in Canada will mean an escape from the undocumented Spanish boys and their non-union below code labor, which he blames for his paychecks being unsteady, brittle these days. I don't bother explaining globalism to him as if I understand it, as if it threatens my livelihood the same way it threatens his. Good money. The lingua franca in this age of quick growth and panoramic decay. Our world becoming the old world. The new world just a flimsy babble tower. My neighbor must go build it so he may one day drop his power drill or bequeath it to me instead of his son who builds websites. His son, who will live beyond us, a citizen of this shrinking earth, where no one will need to know the leagues of salty blood, salty water, marking a Mexican from a Spaniard. Our sleeping globe, it dreams this one dream of expansion everlasting. Sort of jumping around books. I don't read from my first book uh, that often, if ever. Um, I think I cringe if someone brings it to me. But there's still a poem or two that I'll claim. <laughs> this is one of them. The Battlefield for Daryl Burton. That night, a mantle of snow fell over all the bodies. Sharp and fine, like the sky was grating itself. Limbs twice brittle, cold on corpus mortem, sunk while ground and horizon grew to touch each other. Five months, the icy shards fell like one name, cataloging every breathless man as one casualty. It dissolved with their flesh and seeped into the pores beneath the grass. Widows flocked to wells, to rivers, scooping hands in buckets, shoes and skirt bottoms. Each poured what they gathered into wooden bowls, flexed forearms with the alchemy of making dough they feed to pear-shaped kilns. When the bread baked, they gathered all the daughters, made them watch while boys ate. So this is a, a, a huzzle, um, Persian form. I was making my students write these, and I felt bad. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll punish myself, too. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a lovely form. Uh, points of contact. Name one revolution whose inception was unlike a fist. Factions disparate then tucked together, coiled like a fist. Foreign policies are symbol languages, idiomatic, cryptic. In America, nothing says we desire peace like a fist. The heart is a one-man rave in the body's industrial district. Blood drunk and insomniac, it pumps toward sleep like a fist. Mammogram magic revealed my lover's dense breast. Behind each nipple I kissed, a soft knock threatened her like a fist. 
Our universe's yet shattered mysteries fear the astrophysicist. Damn his galaxy's thick glasses, his mind relentless, like a fist. Like a glove, the young room exalts his wife's love, its fit. Sounds romantic. He means sex, her love's grip, like a fist. An unfocused punch, Kyle, risk a broken hand or wrist. So laden the psyches of men, Father, must I also think like a fist. Um, all right, I'll read two more poems, because uh, I do want to take questions. So I think that's been one of the best parts of these readings. <coughs> Mention grief, so I'll, I'll do grief. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> poem is uh, for my grandmother, who passed away a few years ago. It's the, the matriarch of our family. Uh, we've been kind of broken since she died. Um, None of us saints. For Ruth Darden. Tell me who presides over the service when the minister's mother has died. Whose hands attempt to lift him? Who surveys his self-anointing face, explains, this is the Lord's will. The cancer that swam through and seized the body in which the preacher's flesh first firmed. Thou art rock. Thou hast proven thyself firm. Maybe. It's possible he could write himself weak though giving his weight to the pulpit and raise his mother's spirit skyward with the wind aid of God's breath. But no, he would be more human than holy at her passing, more Adam than angel. Let him remain on the floor, saliva and tears blended on his lips as he begs, no talk of God, my mother is dead. Tell me where I'll find that preacher. He is the one I will summon to send my dying grandmother home. A man, not a rock. For none here are Peter, none of us saints. We are braids tied between birth and death's buoys. None of us know that dark sea beneath. But bring me the preacher who can cry, who I can see brims with salt and water. Uh, this last poem is uh, Mulligan, uh, in the golf sense. And thank you all for listening. Mulligan. If I have failed as a man, upon inspiring, I'll be returned to this fuzzy rock as a koi. I'll swell against enclosure like, a, like an American again. But this time, it will be my body bloating instead of my ego. I pray I do not fail. I lament the lives of bright fish in ponds, mouths cleaving water, gasping with no language to expel. That is why we love dolphins. They're what we dream of, talking fish. What we hope fortune's will will stop upon should the gods dial back our evolution. But I'm certain that if I fail, I'll be brought back as a silent, ornamental koi, and not a dolphin. I've already said enough in this life, me and my big wet mouth. <laughs> Thank you. such a rare treat to be here and I, I'm so grateful to Pat even for lending me his spectacles <laughs> <laughs> to Jen for being such a, a calm presence all week while we've been doing the workshops which again have been such a gift and such an education for me as well
burying the wren. So these are the dog days when the sea boils and the wine turns sour, when the sky thunders and the house cries out, dearest, you promised you'd be near. One day you just fetched up. Love me, I said. Who else was there to step into my thorny heart? Who knew enough in their half-life of soul mess blather to take my hand in the dark wood and walk with me away? Now this might be my hardest weather. You called to me and call again. Oh skittish, I am all astray. If I look up now when the sky burns black, perhaps I can remember this, your way of leaving us and our long night. Love, blessing, liturgy, the prayer of the unholy and getting you death rattle, heart stop, sending you in the long boat of your body where worlds and words collide was not the end of love. Yet, love, you've been with me enough. So I must let you be, remove myself from the cool earth, where weeds will blossom, rivers run, your pyre of turf that burns along the drift of speedwell and bog thistle, primrose, pimpernel and vetch, where rain will learn to fall once more, and lightning bring its electricity to animate the uncaged heart. Here, where a wren sings flirty in the older, in the long hot days of May, when you are three years gone. So there are lots of birds in that book, uh, and, and a lot of uh, the, the idea of the wren came from um, the times when we were spending time with our children in Ireland and um, up, up in Mayo, in fact. Um, and my name is a Welsh name and it, uh, it means basically a small brown nondescript bird. Um, <laughs> that's one. Um, <laughs> It's also been really important to me as, as, as a name because I felt, you know, Liverpool is a very, um, it's a place where lots of cultures meet and mingle and there is also a sense that you're always slightly estranged from yourself when you know yourself in another language and of course uh, growing up in Liverpool I didn't have any Welsh so I was always speaking myself through another country in a way and so birds have become very important to me as a way <coughs> crossing over across the cultures that I belong to, I suppose, but also birds coming from the underworld and crossing up into, into here, where we are now. So there's a series of poems now uh, with a, a, a loose title called A Courtship, and I became really interested in birds, and yes, I went and looked at birds outside, but um, that had some limitations. Um, so I went to YouTube and uh, started watching the really beautiful mating rituals of birds, which are so elaborate. And uh, this one is called Great Crested Greaves. It is spring. Let us call it spring. Where February tips the wings of March with whitened skies. Here, where this dance of birds is the slowest, kindest measure. The arc and rainbow of their luring, a graceful shimmer and a bright display. The water and reflection ask no question of themselves. Head shake, head turn. He dives to her return. Together they fly up. Her white throat twitches his white throat. The black crests of their heads, the russet flash across cheek and ears. They are moving together, they are drawing away. Believe 
she says, believe. They are making a place for themselves in the waters. He feeds her weed, twigs held for nesting. And look how he rises up with parted beak behind her in the reeds to mount her with a tenderness. Uh, the next uh, part of these uh, poems is called Bow Birds. And, uh, Bowbirds construct these very um, elaborate dens, and the, the male birds use them as a sort of um, part of the mating ritual. So all the, the male birds, I mean, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing terribly, but they, they make these little houses, and they are extraordinary. And they can be made out of coke cans, and they have little roofs, and they always have a garage and a drive. And, and they, the, the birds collect shells, and they, they make these extraordinary patterns. And then the female bowbird comes along and decides which bowbird house she likes the best, and then she mates with that bird. Um, yeah. <laughs> Start now with the smallest things. A pile of blackened acorns, glinting beetle wings, the green fruit and purple flowers of the potato bush. He trails a path of halts and hesitations, like stations of the cross. Turns colour in his mind, perspective, snail shells or the blue of berries. Is that a bud of jasmine in his beak? His bar, I see, is thatched with orchid stems, moss laid like a lawn at the entrance to his bivouac, orange leaves like a pool of restless koi. This stuff he collects as a small boy might, adrift on a prayer of football cards and dinosaurs. All settles as he eyes her, and here, now like a seal on his heart, a bed of blooms pulled from a bush. How carefully he's considered her, this pink, he thinks, of roses. And then the lyrebird, and the lyrebird um, can imitate uh, all sorts of sounds, not just other birds, but the sound of a, 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 a revving car, or a camera shutter, or a radio. I think they have up to about 10 sounds that they can make. Lyre bird. To draw her close, he sings his debris opera. Kookaburra, car alarm, camera shutter, oriole. Rewires his love through the echoes of the forest. Tree gully, bushfire, eucalyptus, ferns. Had we a theory of love to set a sound against, perhaps it would be this the harp of his voice box, legislating song. Here are frequencies and sound bites gleaned from his elders, rifle bird, jeep paw, shrike thrush, silver eye. Their love, if it makes it, jackhammer, laughter, crimson, rosella, is the moment of its making, the gorgeous, urgent span of him, a net to the winds. Honey eater, chainsaw, scrub wren, robin. He steps up to his mound of dirt to make the world his own. If only she would love him. It is winter. Soon he will leave her, butcher bird, child's cry. To draw her close, he sings. And the last one is some collared doves. An afternoon that hints of rain, and in the branches of the backyard conifer, a pair of collared doves perform their springtime ritual. Wing flap, bow. He nudges her, she nods to his pursuit, a freeze frame foolishness kabuki dance, their black ringed necks and movements mirroring, a preening and a fluttering, a nibble of the bill. And then she lets him come to her, the sudden rise to flight, a blush of feathers as he rests his weight on hers. 
It will always be this way, she knows. The soft cry of that coo, coo, coo as shadow presses shadow. And how could she not have known to love it? She who learnt meanings of not, not, no, never. They who have come so late to each other. And just to dispel that sort of romantic haze I was in. Um, <laughs> This is, this is kind of nasty, and it's a kind of, um, it's a sort of revenge poem, but it's a version, I'm trying to do all these versions of uh, Rambo's Season in Hell, and uh, this is Night in Hell. I swallowed a mouthful of poison, you, and like accounts I've read of toxic mushrooms which, destroying angel, skullcap, deathcap, Stealthily burst the structure of a cell, their latent damage holding fire. So only later did I vomit, sweat, as once half cocked and heavy breathed before delirium convulsions gripped, you sweated in a bed with me and liver, kidneys, heart, darling, my soul gave up. Hallucinations? Sure. The ghost of many pains steps forth. A cache of maggots eating flesh, then rising like black cinders from a poem's burnt out core. Such drunken layabouts, those dizzy flies, they soon became banging their stupid heads and compound eyes against the mucky window. My father, with his amputated foot, stood at their mercy, frail, erect, stomped bald inside a shoe, then later, dead, his mouth and eyes half open, looked, reminded me of you. You were there, I know, searching for nothing by way of nothing, that night you scorched your veins and overdosed on lack of love, so protoplasmic damage took its toll. It's nothing I ought to tell, the roses at my bedside blacken. There's a bruise on my shoulder that doesn't escape us, an invisible ring that has left no mark. And though the hands on my wristwatch have frozen, I push my face into the pillow. We lie there with our dead selves in the earth where I damn you, sticky with insects, fungus, worms, I'll finish with um, a sequence that I've written um, really about uh, some of those times that we spent in, in Ireland and, uh, and the final poem about my father-in-law. So this is called In Memoriam. Um, uh, the title had gone for that poem, so um, I just called it I Am. And, and uh, just to say about these, they're all 13 lines long, and uh, I was playing, and I am playing a lot with these ideas of what um, I call my disappointed sonnets. And, uh, I think it was Joyce, Joyce that said that a, a pier was a disappointed bridge, and uh, I, I love that idea so much. Um, and what I wanted to do with the form was to put the rhymes in the middle of the poem sometimes, so that they were crossing up... Um, and to, to start disturbing all, all the things that we, we know work so beautifully in sonnets and to sort of get them uh, deliberately wrong. Sometimes at Easter we drive west, stopping makeshift at our curious stations, once to put a bet on the horse, once slowed behind a whole village, a man dragging a man-sized cross. Now Easter is come round again, and I stand once more by a restless lock. Your body's ashes drift, Cara, Corrib, the shores of Cara Moor. A landscape has become a conversation. Mountains godlike touch my godlessness, Cleopatric stained by pilgrims' feet. Darling, what did I leave when we left you?
where sky and water meet. An old love is a kind of promise. In the first rush of new unholy orders, there's a wish to make a body limitless. <coughs> now here's a longing for my breast to meet a mouth, for you again to slip your hands inside my heart and with a turn of limbs to bring a rhyme of colour to my cheek. Owl hoot, fox call, a phone rings in a distant house. How to be one in this strange equation? We drive together in the dark. I mark a simple prosody in making tea. Later, in each other's ghostly arms, the radio will sing us both asleep. The bed is drenched with sweat. Beyond the sunshine and the open windows, I name the birds who draw an endless song. I see us now reflected in that mirror. You lift me up, we hold each other down. Is it too much, you ask, not letting go? You stack up logs beside the fire, bind up our cottage beams in mistletoe. And how could my body not cry out harmonics <coughs> of our loveliness? Your voice sits in my mobile phone. It was our perfect happiness to make yourself my own. I drifted into trees. The arborist's banter when I ask him how he came to this. He names ash, alder, silver birch, trees that would suit this backyard better tells me to listen to the family of wrens who've nested in the neighbour's eaves. What would I give to become this Daphne, rooted and evergreen, desire doubling each year in awkward growth beneath the seagull's melancholy boot? In the next door yard, a flock of green finches like leaves take flight. Their gorgeous, synchronous songs are torment. The common laurel which I plan to fell today can stand for love, this hell. <coughs> Into this breakage and this breach, its roughened magic, love approximate, an urge comes to fix and mend, to search to cure myself of sickness, to detonate myself to life, to cure myself of you. Stitching for one who cannot sew, mendings for that which we can't mend. I gather a coat of burrs and nettles. You look up from a book I never watched you read. Love, what was the gift you thought you were giving? What in the end do I have to leave? I raise from YouTube the songs of birds. Skylark, Nightingale, play them teacherly to a sleepy class. On my desk are letters, birds' nests from the garden, blackbird, linnet, song thrush, robin. Would you know, I ask, what Keats knew, Claire, matching a bird to a pattern of knowing, taking a stanza from form to flight? To be twenty and begin again. To love madly and for so long. Hairs rise like golden feathers up my arm. Love in the dreamy reaches of our brains. Your absence asks if love was ever wrong. House of the Singing Winds. At the foot of the sugar loaf, blackthorn spikes and bribes the hedgerows. Crows gather in the upward fields. Now grief is written in their dark alignments. Sorrow in a nearby field of horses. In an absent moment, I can still look up to see you there. Call out in sleep or pull two glasses from the press. Daily text messages arrays. I turn my back on you until you leave. 
and relearning the metrics of being alone. I cannot show you the English gardens now you are gone. Not the magnolia tree breaking extravagantly open. Not cyclamen, narcissus or delphinium. The fiery tulips with their mild soft spillage. A liturgy of spring that steers to summer. Foxglove, rose, peony, geranium, as I sit here with our sun. The stepping stones steal through the grass. The tilting water clock that measured out my childhood's gone. I put myself to my own test. It is a prayer demanding answer, asks what I would be wooden of. Perfection in execution, a repetition like desire. Here is the joy of shifts and modulations. Bugs, cello suites demanding our attention. Like anything I say, you have to practice love. Now I have missed the sight of us together, watching a thousand field furs smear the February air. Were I to practice love again, I'd hold the memory of the morning, hand in hand, as we watched a fledgling robin open up its throat beside the river. Bach's cello sweets shout out for my attention, as March now runs to April. I hear a robin song, remembering how, down empty lanes, a thousand field fairs, so it seemed, rose up to splinter winter's air. And I'll just finish with a tiny poem I hope I can find. Oh, maybe I can't. <laughs> it's disappeared. It's called Rua, and Rua is the name that my uh, children called their Irish grandmother because she had red hair. She was Granny Rua. Just weeks before you died, we came to visit. We stroked the trembling rouge mantilla of your hair. Your body had capsized into your clothes. For a moment now, I'm following the hearse on foot again through the narrow lanes of Dorky. There's a soundtrack of nothing as we pass. We look across the sea to home. Suddenly, beyond the 40 foot, nose tipped to the falling light, I see her like a lost child or a sea fox in a blazing world, that lone seal on a stone. Thank you so much for this time. So we've got a five, five minutes or so for questions. Um, I've been asked by the sound engineer to gather us all together by the microphone here. <laughs> Cuddle in. And <laughs> um, so I, <coughs> bouncing, I'll ask a couple of questions myself to prepare yours because I want to give you a chance to ask as well. Um, there is a line in your revenge poem that really jumped out at me <laughs> that said, uh, nothing I ought to tell. And I wondered for both of you, um, is there anything that's off limits for you personally? In, I'm not asking you to give details, or obviously, because if you're not going to write about it, you don't want to tell us. But <laughs> in general topics, things that you won't want to write about, not don't write about, but won't write about. <laughs> That's a big question to start there. <laughs> uh, cat categorically, no. Um, I mean, I think we're all, in some ways, trying to work towards a place where we're comfortable having our entire selves on the page. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's 
is one of the things that I so there there are things where if you'd ask me two books ago I'd say yes this this right. this <laughs> and then you look two books later it's like oh you're doing those things it's like well I got I, I trusted myself enough to do that so I, I think it's just a gradual process of trying to get your whole self on the page. I like that about you, you learning to trust yourself or it's, that's interesting. I, I think you figure it out, as you say, as you, as you go along, but I, I also, you know, think I'm a very private person, and I'm, I'm not sure that there is anything there, really, that's necessarily, you know, comes from me, but, um, you know, that, that whole thing about the lyric, that whole bother that we have with the lyric, about where the eye sits, you know, um, there's a big jump when I speak myself in language and, and do all the manipulations that, that mm -hmm. one does in a poem. So, um, yeah, we, we talked a lot this week about the ethics of, of these things. How do you write things? Or, you know, maybe there are things you can't write, but you actually have to go and do something instead. So I think that's a constant negotiation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, <coughs> thinking about uh, the, the poetry that goes to, to difficult places, um, whether it be anger or sadness or the, the, re the really intense stuff, um, which most poetry comes from, I guess. How much distance, I wonder, do you need from the event or the, the person um, to, to be able to write about it? Can you write about it from the heat of anger or, or sadness, or do you need t time or a distancing technique of some kind uh, to help you get started with the big stuff. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, I think the whole process of writing, from the moment you feel something and okay. you start thinking of words, you know, and like when I, when I always ask people, like, are you writing? And they're like, well, no, I haven't, I haven't put out a draft in a while. I'm like, well, are you thinking about it? And they said, yeah, like, well, you're writing. That's the, the beginning of it. So it's just, you know, how much thinking happens before I get to the page, and that I can't give you a, a, an answer of why or how that that happens. How many do you answer? I don't. I try not to write angry poems just as a rule. Sure. Uh, for myself, because I mean, there's really only but so much vintage you want to get back on someone's poetry. Okay, so uh, no revenge poems. If, it, if, it's, if it's that important, then you know we need this. But, sure. Okay. <laughs> then it's time for action. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> that, that was wrong. But it was revenge, not revenge. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, such rational people because there's something about that people are telling me I'm, I'm a yank obviously but like the the curse poem in the Irish language has always appealed to me um, I'd love to be able to read those in the original but I think that maybe I'm a darker person than the two so considering that can we open that up to the nice people <laughs> before it goes the wrong way um, yeah um, you, you each mentioned writing to a form as a hazard and as a sonnet that I can't, and I just wondered if you could talk about how useful <coughs> you find forms in poetry. I know you have to you have to teach them. Do you yeah. find it valuable to teach them? Uh, uh, yes, it, I think it's also important to uh, remind people though that a lot of our received forms uh, we have them because you know poetry began as song. Right? And a lot of the elements that are in form are there to help us remember these very long things that weren't written down anywhere. Um, so I think when you start to fetishize just like receive form on the page, um, and you think, well, you know, I wrote a poem in 14 lines, it has this rhyme scheme, um, it has a, a bolter here, therefore it's a sonnet. Not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's not like a shopping list where you just walk through and you just check everything off and you've done it, but you have to find some way to fulfill or repurpose, you know, to use the form or else you're just sort of acting it out. So that's my, my main thing. It's like, I, 
you know, right in form, but right in form for a reason. Um, yes. That's the, the one of the things that I, I try to tell people. I mean, experiment, of course, but <coughs> have some intent. Can you repeat the name of that form that you referred to? I didn't hear it. It's a, a chazel, but it has a G at the beginning. So it's G H A Z A L. So some people say gazel. It's, it's not right. It's, it's <laughs> Right, so the, in, the, in the last uh, <coughs> couplet, I guess, the poet's uh, supposed to uh, invo invoke uh, her himself. So that's where the name is. Now, I also see some people take interesting twists on that. Like, if your name sounds like something else, you can do it, but like without actually invoking. So um, that part's interesting. I, I cheated in a way, not exactly, but the first line doesn't have to rhyme. Um, and that's something I picked up from the uh, American poet Natasha Trethewey. Um, she has a hustle called uh, Miscegenation. This is a quite good poem. And she rhymes the first lines um, as well as the refrain in the second. So I figured I wanted to try that. <laughs> okay. Um, can I, uh, before we leave, I wonder, because obviously we're all going to go and buy your books and order the rest that we can't find online because you're a fantastic book of you. Um, could you give us a recommendation of somebody you've read recently that you absolutely love, or if that's too much of an immediate question, just one classic that you think, go out there and treat yourself to this poet. Give us a recommendation from your... Uh, well, for me, it's a young poet who uh, I've been working with very closely called Ruby Robinson, and her book is out in April, and I think she's really amazing. And also, I was talking to somebody today about Chase Twitchell's book, Perdido, which is a book I come back to again and again. And, uh, <coughs> I, I love that book. Chase Twitchell, Perdido, Ruby Robinson, okay. Uh, there's a young... Uh, American Vietnamese poet named Ocean uh, Vaughn, yeah. who will have a book coming out. Uh, so I, I think it should be good. Uh, that's a prediction, so you can't count it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be a good book. Definitely. Okay. Thanks. Uh, can you please give a, a warm thank you to.